Welcome. My name is Natasha Sherman. I am your host. And my guest today is Dr. Bob Rosenthal. He is a psychiatrist and also author of the book, From Plagues to Miracles. Welcome. Thank you, Natasha. Pleasure to be here. Yes, and I'm happy to have you here to talk about what you do and to talk about your book and kind of how they weave in and out of each other. So as a psychiatrist, I'm assuming you are in private practice? Yes, I have a, a solo private practice, so it's just me, captain of the ship. Um, unlike most psychiatrists today, uh, I do primarily psychotherapy, so I'm actually working with people. I like to joke that as an author, we have to do a great deal of editing, and as a psychiatrist, I'm a professional editor for people's lives. I look at where the script went in the wrong direction, and I try to help them do a rewrite that will take them to a better place. Um, so I conceptualize myself as an old school psychiatrist. So it's not, nowadays I think the perception is the psychiatrist is the one you send them to in order to get a prescription. Exactly. Okay. And, and it's not that I don't do that, right. I will, but. But you're very invested in actually doing therapy. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And so then you've written this book, From Plagues to Miracles, and it's kind of maybe a spiritual handbook from a different pers from someone from your perspective oh, and yeah. you you take a particular area of the Bible and um, talk about a spiritual journey uh, how does that come out of your psychotherapy practice or is there any relationship at all well that's a great question um, there very definitely is a relationship but I was already on a spiritual journey well before I even went to medical school. So the spiritual came first. And I think part of my attraction for psychotherapy in particular was the idea that in this, in this conceptualize it as a sacred space of the psychiatrist's office, he or she gets to have this unique relationship with another human being who is willing to be vulnerable, share their life history, um, and, as I said earlier, hopefully take that in a better place. Now, um, the idea for my book, From Plagues to Miracles, and the full title is From Plagues to Miracles, The Transformational Journey of Exodus from the Slavery of Ego to the Promised Land of Spirit. So this is very much about the biblical book of Exodus, um, but it's also not at all about your father's exodus. Um, this is not just another redo uh, or rehash of Bible stories. What I've tried to do is give it, it's uh, a completely unique interpretation. Of course, after I wrote it, I had no idea it was unique. I was fully expecting um, some rabbi or pastor to come up and say, well, doctor, are you aware that you know, so-and-so church father in the seventh century did exactly this or you know, this? But nobody has done that. Um, there actually was a book apparently by uh, a Christian mystic, Gregory of Nicaea, in the 4th century that looked at the Moses story as a spiritual journey, but of course he came to very, very different conclusions than I did. Mm. So the way that it connects up with psychotherapy is, is as follows. My as a psychiatrist, I do a lot of work with dreams. And when you're interpreting a dream, one of the best ways to look at a dream is that all figures in the dream represent some aspect of the dreamer. So when I looked at Exodus as a dream, and indeed, almost all great myths mm -hmm. follow an archetypal um, truth, uh, just as dreams do. So they're kind of uh, you know, doorways into the greater unconscious. By the way, I think this is the true Bible code. It's not going through the Bible and picking out you know, letters and stringing them together to find predictions. The true Bible code is what is the deeper level of the story? What is the real meaning of the narrative? So when I look at all the characters of Exodus as figures or aspects or archetypes of the human mind, well, Moses is very clearly that aspect of us that has an amazing close connection to God, spirit, higher self. Um, you can call it by a number of names. Pharaoh, on the other hand, would be that aspect of the human mind that has us imprisoned and keeps us in bondage. And the Hebrew people would be all of us. Uh, they, they start out free. Uh, they're rapidly put into um, slavery by Pharaoh. And, by the me. ego. 
exactly by the ego and then Moses comes along and says uh, hold on <laughs> and through a series of miracles and plagues uh, which I would argue are also miracles and we could talk about that in a minute they find themselves on this road to the promised land which when they were enslaved in Egypt this is not even what they were thinking about um, so I think it's actually a wonderful metaphor for the spiritual journey because very few people realize that they are enslaved much less that there is such a journey or that some state of mind that we can label the promised land really exists you know we're doing our best just to kind of you know pay the bills raise the kids uh, get places on time right. um, so no <clears throat> deeper inquiry so um, the uh, you know, so from what you say, it's, you know, we're functioning in everyday life, kind of not thinking too much about the bigger picture and being ego driven. And uh, then s the spiritual aspect starts to draw some attention sometimes, sometimes it doesn't. Yes. And then that spiritual aspect, as it starts to flourish, is also challenged by the ego because the ego feels threatened exactly I mean you know Moses flees Egypt after trying to free his people through a murder this clearly doesn't work and I think it's it's, it's a good directive <clears throat> for most people that the path of violence the path of war doesn't really achieve freedom um, it actually makes things worse uh, and if you look at the history of the US and Iraq over the last 10 years I think that's fairly evident um, but once Moses is, is away and he sort of, you know, finds a wife and he has children and he's kind of forgotten about this journey, what happens? Oh, he's out there one day and he sees this, this fire on the horizon and, oh, it's a burning bush. And what the Bible says is that he turns aside to go and look at it. It doesn't scare him. This isn't, you know, some forbidding, punishing voice that says, Moses, you know, you did it wrong. Mm -hmm. um, it intrigues him. It causes him to turn aside and he goes and investigates. And that's when he's told, um, excuse me, guy, uh, Moses, you had a purpose here. You had a job to do and you kind of got lost. You need to go into Egypt. You need to confront Pharaoh. You need to let my people go. Now, at that time, Pharaoh was the most powerful human being in the known universe. This guy ruled the kingdom of Egypt, the most advanced civilization, and he was a direct descendant of the Egyptian gods. So this is no small task. But again, switching to the metaphor of Exodus, mm -hmm. what it's telling us is that we are imprisoned by this ego mind, if you will, mm -hmm. that we don't realize it, and that we have this daunting task of, of in a sense, reaching not out, but reaching in to find that part of us that knows how to free us from slavery. Now, there's some from our own slavery. Yeah. Um, this ties in with Buddhism. Uh, the Buddha's first noble truth was that all life is dukkha. Dukkha translated as dissatisfaction or suffering. <laughs> um, and the point being, sure, go after what you think will make you happy. You know, find that ideal guy or gal go make yourself a couple, you know, hundred million dollars. Uh, at the end of the day, <clears throat> your body's gonna age, you're gonna get sick most likely, and you're absolutely gonna die, <clears throat> you know. And at some point along the way, I think, you know, this whole thing about the burning bush where he doesn't get afraid or whatever, he's kind of captured by it, captivated. Yes. And so there's an inquiry that opens up, and uh, what should I do? And I think, you know, as the description of you know, you find the gal, the guy, the make the money, whatever. Uh, in the end, if you don't get captivated, so to speak, uh, it, uh, you don't get the question, is that all there is? That's because right. I suspect somewhere along the way, everybody has that question some of the time. So is this it? Is I, this it? I wish more people did. I think a lot of people um, grab at that question when they get a terminal diagnosis, for example. Right. You know, because that certainly, uh, you know, concentrates the mind, as they say. But, but I, as I, you say, life is terminal. And life is terminal. Yeah, these bodies will die. This personality will no longer be there. <clears throat> but um, I, I sometimes think this is why there are 
perhaps more people interested in religion and spirituality in their older years than younger. Mm. Uh, most psychologists and psychiatrists would say, well, they're just afraid of dying, so they have to reach out to something different. I, I believe it's also the fact that you've, you know, you've run life's race uh, to a large extent. You've tried a lot of stuff, uh, you know, and, and you realize that the happiness in that is, is fleeting. Um, yes, sure, there are these great moments, you know, high fives, we did it. Uh, but I'll bet if we interviewed lottery winners, Olympic gold medalists, uh, winners of Nobel Prizes, well... Well, I think it's like anything else. It's like scoring the touchdown or whatever. It's wonderful, it's fabulous, but it's not enduring. Exactly. And, you know, it's interesting because I, I lived at a yoga center in India for almost a year, and a, uh -huh. a teacher said, I remember him talking about how in the yoga writings or whatever, you know, they divide life into segments. So there's youth and then there's, you know, when you go to school and then there's the householder journey. Yes. And then it's not because necessarily because you're afraid of dying, but you've done your dharma as they would say in Buddhism. And now there's an opportunity for you to focus on the spiritual growth. Exactly. And I think that it actually is beneficial to have done all of those in order to recognize that that way happiness lies not. You know, you're not going right. to find it there. Yeah, I mean, in uh, Herman Hesse's wonderful novel, Siddhartha, he goes through those stages, one of my personal favorites, and, you know, and finally wanders off. And that is the final stage in the life of the Hindus, the sannyasin. You know, you right. leave your wife and house, and of course, it's a very sexist religion in that regard, because <laughs> the wives have to stay home and handle all. Right. One could argue they have the more spiritual path. <laughs> oh, they have the more spiritual path all along the way. But uh, I have a question yes. for you, which may seem bizarre at this stage. Why did you write the book? Well, the book actually came out of an insight that I had in 1987, so many, many years before I actually started writing. And I should say, I'm not a Bible scholar. I, I read Exodus for the first time because I had the idea and thought about turning it into a book. But in 1987, I was on the faculty of an academic medical school, and I experienced um, a department that, from one year to the next, went from being an ideal place to work to feeling like slavery. Every mm. time I would walk in in the morning, there was a sense of, oh my God, do I have to? Uh, and when will this day be done? I suspect that many people out there can relate to that in their jobs. And I had a boss who I really admired, who I, I believe went into something of a depression and that mm. affected the whole division. But I wanted to get out. I knew I wanted freedom. And I didn't know how to do that because um, this man who was our, uh, our, our boss, our supervisor, was known to not take kindly to people leaving his mm. department. <laughs> so I felt very stuck and I took it to a spiritual place and I was like, you know, help. You know, let my people go, so to speak. Mm. And the Red Sea parted. He made me an offer I couldn't accept, uh, to paraphrase the Godfather. Um, and before I knew it, I was free and clear. He and I remained friendly. So um, you left the job? I left the job. And Did this, you leave it knowing you were going to write, or just leave it saying, I just no, I'm at that it because point, I'm leaving it? Yeah, at that point, I was not writing. I had put all writing aside uh, from college, really. Mm -hmm. um, so I just knew I, I had to get out. Mm -hmm. uh, I knew it wasn't healthy for me. And it was around the time of the Jewish festival of Passover, which um, has always been my personal absolute favorite holiday, not just of Judaism, but of any religion mm -hmm. I've come across. Uh, and so in th applying the, the teachings of Passover to what I was going through, it felt like, wow, I was stuck, now I have freedom. I need to think more deeply about what this holiday mm -hmm. means. Mm -hmm. And that was when I first thought, oh, you know, maybe Moses is the part of us that, that knows the path to freedom, and Pharaoh is the part of us that not only doesn't know it, it's that voice in your head that goes, no, you can't do that. No, no way. That's absurd. You'll die. You won't survive. Of course you need to keep your job as a street sweeper and not play in that band. How could you, you know. Um, and what I have to interrupt you <laughs> yeah. here because I have the best expression and you have to excuse the verbiage, but someone once described it, one of my trainers, as the itty bitty shitty committee in your head. I love that. Isn't that great? That's pretty good. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's quite accurate. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. And it's the voice that says, oh, you can't, you shouldn't, don't, be afraid, et cetera, et cetera. Be afraid, be very afraid. So then how did you then leap into finding yourself writing? 
Well, I actually, I mean, my writing journey went in a lot of different directions. I started writing science fiction, which was something I was very fond of. Then I discovered uh, I've always been real interested in movies, so I wrote screenplays for nine years, wrote a TV pilot, uh, and I kept coming very, very close uh, and nothing quite catching fire. I mean, we were. And in the meantime, just out of curiosity, yeah. on a personal level, what supported you financially? Um, oh, you had I, left your job. Uh, no, I, I didn't leave my job. Um, I, I left that job at the that teaching job. hospital okay. and went into full-time okay. private practice. Yeah. Okay. yeah, no, 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 no. I, I do not advocate that anyone leave their day job uh, to follow That's their dream. That's why I asked the question. Right. right, but I don't advocate that anyone forget their dream right. solely for the sake Absolutely. of their day job. Because what happens in the Exodus book when Pharaoh and Moses, the part of us that wants to lead us to freedom and the part that is antithetical to freedom, con contend. Plagues happen. Now, to the Pharaoh part, those plagues are horrific. They devastate its kingdom. very personal. Very personal. I mean, leading right up to the death of the firstborn. But to the Hebrews, who are us, the plagues are the road to freedom. And, and I think if there is one take-home message that I would ask people to um, extract from my book and its interpretation, it would be exactly that. Where in your life are you suffering plagues? That is to say, where are the hardships? Where is the pain? Where is that sense of I am so stuck that I don't know how to get through this and I just look up and go, help? That so what's the message in that? So you ask people, like, really examine it. Don't just wake up every day and say, oh my God, another day, you know, and um, or I can't face this. So let's say you are examining it and you say, you know, here's where I'm suffering, here's where I'm stuck, here's where I'm afraid, then what? I would say realize that the answer to that lies not within the domain of, the, of your life as you know it, that that answer has to come from somewhere else. I mean, this is very much like 12-step programs where the first step is, you know, I was powerless over my alcoholism, gambling, overeating, whatever you may call it, and I had to turn it over to a higher power. Now, the so this higher power doesn't have to be religious. Not at all. It's just an acknowledgement of there's something bigger than what I see in the immediate. Yes, and that something bigger knows how to orchestrate things in a way that we don't. And that's where, you know, to the um, rationalists and skeptics, what I would say is, you know, the God you don't believe in, I don't believe in him either. The idea that there's an anthropomorphic person in the sky with a big white beard who hangs out on the chapel, the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, no, 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 no. Um, and in fact, in the prelude to my book, I talk about, you know, a few words about God. What is God? But I would say that if you take the chance and sincerely say help and then step out of the way, let go of the problem, turn it over, not with helplessness, ah, oh, this is impossible, but turn it over with, with, an, in with an intention, mm. with an intention. I want to be free. I want to see this differently. I could be experiencing peace instead of this conflict. You know, it's so then interesting. Then let it go and see and what it's happens. It's so powerful because, on the one hand, you know, I like to extract it all from, you know, any specific religion or you have to believe in X, Y, and Z, you know, because, but, you know, if you think of it, the very fact that your body has the knowledge that it has to do what it does indicates. There's something going on that maybe I don't know about. It's not necessarily a person, but if my body's doing what it's designed to do, and that bumblebee is doing what it's designed yes. to do, then maybe there's just some way to tap into the bigger design. I, I mean, it would make sense, wouldn't it? Or why, I mean, if there is that bigger design, if there is, let's call it intelligence with a capital I, mm -hmm. that knows more than our limited neocortex and brain right. uh, knows how to, what it's about, then wouldn't it be actively trying to reach us? But again, going to Exodus, um, it's very interesting. Notice, God in Exodus doesn't jump into the picture and say, all right, Pharaoh, boom, you're out. Hebrews, I'm teleporting you to the promised land. Mm -hmm. God can't do it for us. We have to get out of the way. We have to open that door first. What God in that sense, and I'll put God in quotes here, does is inflicts plagues on the ego mind, hardships, dukkha to use the Buddhist term, so that we can see that there's a better way. Mm -hmm. um, but we can be pretty stubborn. I mean, Pharaoh was incredibly stubborn, and that's where I think he's a, a wonderful model for ego. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, 
And once we take the chance and get out of the way, that's where the miracles start to happen. Uh, and again, I don't believe for a moment that miracles are confined to the Bible, but I have certainly experienced things in my life. I recount some of them in uh, From Plagues to Miracles that defy rational explanation that if you were looking at what is the probability of that event occurring, it's, it's you know, point, oh, 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 oh. I mean, it's just, it couldn't have happened without some sense of the miraculous. Yeah, and I think it's important to expand our definition of miracle. Yes. Because I can see miracles everywhere all the time, every day. You know, just the, the very fact that I wake up, this body, the, the way it works, the way it functions. The fact that we're talking here. Yeah, exactly. So, again, if you narrow it down to, I need some big explosion in the sky or a burning bush to come and say this to me, and then people are sitting saying, there is no answer, you know, look a little closer. Wonderful. The biggest problem we make in looking for a miracle is we tell God, higher self, what that miracle should, should be. be. I need money, God. I'm going to go buy a bunch of lottery tickets. <laughs> you know, God, higher wisdom, whatever you want to call it, knows how to bring to you what you need far better than you do because you don't know what you need. We're, we're still enslaved in Egypt. We think we know what we want. And then we, we get it and we go, okay, Yeah, and go, all right, that didn't work. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that is the journey. You know, it's the journey that takes us from believing that as an ego, I know exactly what it is and I'm going to, you know, follow that path and trudge it to till I die, mm -hmm. to, no, there really is a different path. And as I walk that, experiences come to me that not only validate that I am not just an ego mind, I'm much more than that, um, but that those experiences begin to impact the people around you. Uh, they give you a different sense of, of what life is about. And when the miracles start showing up, then it becomes very hard to go back to a skeptical point of view or to believe that where you were, you know, before you made that mental transition, that that's really all there is to life. Right. And I think, you know, it's important for people. I mean, the ego is there for a reason. So it's not like bash the ego right. and, uh, you know, beat it into the ground. It's there, but it, the idea is to be aware that it goes hand in hand with spirit. Well, here's the, I mean, as a psychiatrist who was old enough to have been trained in Freudian metapsychology, um, we need the ego to contend with day-to-day -day life. When you're looking at the train schedule, by all yeah. means, use your ego. Don't ask spirit, what train should I take? Uh, <laughs> unless spirit is telling you don't get on that plane, in which case maybe yeah. you listen. I remember Ramda <laughs> saying, you still need to know your zip code. Yeah, exactly. And your phone number and, yes. you know, and all of that. Yeah. So ego has a place, but we've exalted it to a level where we believe that it can take care of everything. Um, and in particularly in the uh, domain of meaning, mm. ego is poorly equipped. Ego does not supply us with meaning. Meaning comes from love, from purpose, from following that spiritual path, from and relationship. And I think most people can get that, as you say it. You know, I think if most people are paying attention, it resonates. When they've experienced that, that's what feels yes. uh, that something that can be, can endure. Yes. Now, we have just a couple of minutes, okay. but I wanted to ask you, um, have you had any reaction from the rabbinical community? Wonderful or? question again. I expected my book to be fairly widely embraced by the rabbinical community, and instead I have had a very bifurcated reaction. Hmm. Um, Rabbi uh, Michael Lerner out in Berkeley gave me a wonderful endorsement. Um, you know, Rabbi Rami Shapiro gave me a wonderful endorsement. There's one local rabbi, but I don't have his permission, so I won't use his name, who gave it an extraordinarily close read and informed me up front that he was a hard reader and he would pull no punches. And he was glowing at the end. He said, you know... So did anybody bash you? Um, I haven't been bashed, but there's been a lot of silence. Mm. I, I know, mm. for example, with local synagogues, um, people, relatives, patients who've given my book to various rabbis or said we'd really like to do a study group, I hear nothing. Um, but, but you know what, that's okay. I'm not on, a, on an evangelical mission no. to spread it. And it's just interesting to, to kind of take a look yeah. at. And I, one of the things I want to ask you so that we clarify 
you don't have to be Jewish to oh, understand not. this book. Uh, it, it's, it's a metaphorical journey, transformational journey, as you say, from slavery to freedom. Right. Now, um, you know, the fact that it's part of the Hebrew Bible, I would remind people that the Hebrew Bible was the only Bible that Jesus of Nazareth knew. Uh, and he would have been intimately familiar with the story of Exodus. I think it probably did inform his own spirituality. Um, you definitely don't have to be Jewish. One of the things that I was hoping to achieve in, in writing this was for people to be able to look at the old Bible and find transformative wisdom in it rather than just the same old Ten Commandments. Right. You know. I, I think this is probably a good place to complete. So your book is available online, yeah. Amazon? I mean, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Hay House uh, website. Uh, I mean, it's, it's widely available. It's available in all of the e-reader, uh, e-book formats. Um, the and Kindle. are you available if somebody wants you to come and do a talk? Um, absolutely. They just have to, you know, let me know enough yes. ahead of time yes. that we can uh, arrange that. Right. Yes. So but I, I just invite people to check it out. And, you know, again, anything that contributes to further inquiry and yes. um, tapping into some spiritual aspect uh, is a positive thing. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you for being thank here. Thank you all. My name is Natasha Sherman. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.